Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Benning Frank. As you've just heard, I'm the CEO of the Munich Security Conference, the other Munich conference. Uh, I do everything that Steffi tells me to do, and she told me to speak about drones, which is something that I have some knowledge of, but I'm definitely not an expert. That's why I got the world's leading thinker on operating software of drones to join me for a conversation of 18 minutes and 14 seconds. And what we wanted to do is to keep you awake by not talking about the obvious, but by talking about what's new. So we all know there are drones, they're all you know, used in war and in, in, in commercial efforts. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about the commercial side first, then about the military usage, and at the end about what that means for global politics. Lawrence, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for joining me and helping me out on this one. So what is new about drones in the commercial world? So drones have been, of course, around. Many of you or your kids will have drones, take pictures, all great. But what's new and what's happening, at least in the US and Africa at scale, is now cargo. Deliveries to end customers. We're working, for example, with Walmart. And so we're going from this innovation phase to a real industrial phase where it's happening at scale. Same thing in Africa, where blood and medicine, blood transfu transfusions and medicine is delivered at scale every day. It's normal. And you know, the title of the session is Autonomous Flying Systems. How autonomous are they actually? I mean, for me, it's still a lot of pilot driven things in the air. I think in the, what you experience in the consumer space, yeah, you, you fly with sticks, right? We've just moved the pilot from the aircraft to the ground, but that is over. This is changing rapidly. So now those drones fly themselves with onboard computing, with onboard AI, and we're moving very quickly to where you have swarms of systems, fleets, and that's a really new era. That's like connecting computers to something called the internet. So we're really entering a completely new phase. Perfect. At the other conference, the Munich Security Conference, we will be talking about drones too. And you know, you've all probably followed the news. You all know about the, the use of Iranian drones in, in Ukraine. You've probably heard about the success of Turkish-built drones in the Armenia-Azerbaijan war. Um, what concerns us most is exactly what, what you mentioned. It's the move from single-purpose drones that are flown by a pilot somewhere to swarms of autonomous vehicles. And I'm sure there are quite a few experts in the room, and I see a former CEO of ESG, uh, an expert in the drone sector back there. Um, what, what we are worried about is, are we ready as the West, as the Transatlantic Alliance, to set the standards on which these drone swarms work? And do we have the right operating procedures in place to deal with this new technological development. And we at the MSC very clearly think we don't, but maybe you, Lawrence, have another opinion. Well, I think as with all new technology, um, there is thought leadership in the US. Uh, we have most of our business in the US, so we're moving really fast in that space. That's also why it's Walmart and not Aldi um, rolling out the first commercial operation. In terms of Security, there is, of course, also usage uh, by the US government in large scale. But what we're seeing in the drone industry, and that's, I think, on an international security scale really new, is that China has a strong domestic industry, which basically means in the new international security environment, every nation, every bloc needs to ask itself, well, what about autonomous? Are we competitive? Are we in a technology fashion moving fast enough? And what does that mean for our future national security? And, and do you have the feeling that, that we're on the right track, that we're catching up? Or are we lacking further and further behind? So I think we're catching up, um, but not fast enough. Because this is accelerating massively. We don't even know what the fusion of autonomous computers and the fast uh, acceleration of AI will mean. I mean, you, you've probably all seen chat, GPT, and other things. AI is suddenly moving so fast. If you bring that in a cyber-physical system, what can you do? 
and that's both exciting but also needs to be managed and as always I think the key thing is you need to be at the leading edge and I think the West in general needs to do more and Europe certainly could contribute a lot more. You know when we, when we met in I think it was Washington a couple of months ago uh, we talked about the NATO standards of drones. Remind me which year was it written in and, and how far are we down the process of making it a little more current? So, uh, like these, these communication systems, they, they're super dated, um, as most military technology, of course. What we're seeing, though, is that in terms of international security, more and more governments realize that commercial technology is the future. And so, for example, the US government has standardized on commercial technology, on commercial communication protocols, They've done that before with a thing called the internet. They've replaced their old legacy networks with commercially derived networking that we're all using today. And um, yeah, we're deeply involved in, in that because we happen to have built a first commercial drone standard, but now it's used everywhere. It's used for Walmart deliveries, but it's also used in large government fleets. Perfect. And you know, to, to get back to NATO, you're trying to evade the question. Um, you know, we're sort of seeing how drone warfare is changing the character of war. And let me ask again, are we ready? Is, is NATO ready um, to have an, a cross-aligned standard that makes sure that we can cope not only with drone action ourselves, but also with drone defense? I think when it comes to autonomous system, systems, it's fragmented as everywhere, as everywhere in the West. And that wasn't a big concern at peacetime, but now in the current age, it's really frightening that every nation has their own systems. They can't talk to each other. You can't combine them. And at the same time, that is exactly what will form the future of, of conflicts. And so I think, no, we're not ready. And no, we're not taking it seriously. And it needs massive investment. And, and where's that investment coming from? I mean, the, the Trade and Technology Council that is supposed to sort of coordinate technological cooperation across the Atlantic is, is looking at a couple of fields and uh, drone technology is part of it. But do you think government-induced investment is enough or do we need uh, new and creative models to generate additional investment? I think, I think we need both. Um, we need government investment. And in particular, we need governments to understand that they have to invest into software computing autonomy and not just the old legacy metal hardware. <laughs> um, and the other part is we need to private investment to follow suit. And we see it in the US. Uh, I just have been recently at the Tech Track 2, uh, Tech Track 2 Symposium in Stanford. There, there, is a, there is a combination of government leadership, but also private investment partnering up. We need a lot more here. We need to stop being frightened about it because in the end, our freedom and Ukraine is showing that our freedom depends on technological leadership. And it's, it's not optional. It's really essential. And, and, and do you have the feeling that there are some, I mean, present company excluded? Where are the European giants? On, on, on drone technology and how do they compare to their Chinese and American counterparts? So I think the Chinese companies are the elephant in the room. Um, I always try to avoid naming individual companies. It's always, I get a lot of tech mes text messages after that. <laughs> but we can talk about DJI, the, the big Chinese company that is flooding European and American markets with drones and which is dominating the market, which is a big problem. We have really good players in Germany, in Munich. We have a great partner here. Um, we, have, we have great companies all across Europe, but they don't see the same support, the same level of support uh, that other companies, including DJI, get internationally. Perfect. And, and, and how much money do you think it needs, cumulative, to, to gain the edge and keep the edge? That's a good question, but it's, it's, it's not dozens, it's certainly hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. I mean, imagine us having this conversation on this stage in 1988, and there's this young guy talking about the thing called the internet, and everybody goes like, like why do I need a network on my computer? 
that is the moment we are in right now when it comes to autonomous computing. And, and so it's, the potential is a lot bigger, but also the need for investment for pushing is a lot bigger than what is happening today. Can you say something about sort of governmental and private sector cooperation on, on development? I know that, that you cooperate both with the private sector and, and the public sector. Um, does that work in that sphere? I think it does very well. In the US, we've been working with the US government since 2018, pushing the envelope on commercial standards, of course, used also by the US government then. And it, it has been extremely beneficial. It moved things forward for na the national security of the US and the defense space. But it also enabled now Walmart to, to deliver cargo. And it's a little bit like with the, with the internet. I think those models are lacking uh, in Europe in general. Um, I think there could be more learning. I'm actually glad that there's the NATO Innovation Fund coming up. Um, so it's changing, it's great, but I think there's a lot more potential. And it's also a critical industry we're in. What we're building is to define our joint freedom to some degree. And so that's also a business that in these difficult times is pretty resilient, pretty robust. It will always be needed. You know, sort of for most people, operating systems sounds sort of like the boring part of it all. Um, it is the boring part. It, it may be, but sort of, let's talk about the sexy part, public perception of drone usage. I mean, you are only one component of the drone system, but is Walmart running into problems when it comes to the acceptance of delivery by drones? Is this something that people want to see because it's quicker and cheaper, or are they, is there a perception of you know, the skites crowding up and, and there being a, a natural limit to the amount of drones that we will be seeing? So um, we, we actually didn't um, arrange that before the session, but we actually did run a competitive we study. We didn't arrange anything before the session. <laughs> we did run a competitive study, and over 80% of Americans want drone delivery. And something around 60% are actually willing to pay for a landing pad, pay, not just accept pay for a landing pad in their backyard to get drone delivery. That completely blew my mind. So yes, very open-minded for this new technology. And it's not limited to, to that. I, I just came back from a trip to Rwanda. We signed a agreement with the government there to help them build their local drone industry at scale. And so it's a little bit, again, where Africa is almost leapfrogging us with things like mobile payment, and other aspects. So yeah, drone usage is everywhere. It's not just in cargo in the US or in the defense space. Perfect. In fact, it's also in the humanitarian field. And I know that Ute from UNICEF is sitting in the first row, and I'm not sure if we have a microphone, because I'd love to ask you a question when I've got you right in front of me. The team behind the stage is probably hating me for this. But you know, drone usage, I mean, yes, people know about the the military use, people know about the commercial use, but the use in the humanitarian field is maybe less obvious. So maybe Ute, come up and tell us a little. And sorry for putting you on the spot. <laughs> but you can't sit there in the first stage and not say anything. <laughs> Thank you, Benedict. Um, yeah, I think UNICEF is proud to be part of a public-private use partnership, actually, in Africa. And uh, we are not talking about autonomous flying systems. Maybe it's a way we should move. It's, it's at the moment, it's piloted uh, uh, flying systems. And um, we have had a pilot project in Malawi, training 1,000 uh, youths, 50% of them women, uh, in flying drones. And what's the use? It's, of course, it's food security, it's health. And, and what does in particular mean is kind of seeing, you know, when you have earthquakes, when you have floodings, you know, what does it mean where you cannot enter anymore? As well as during COVID, there were a lot of health transports. So, so I'm agreeing with you. There's a lot of usage and it's not yet known. And the good thing is at the moment, at least in Africa, and there I'm with you, we're seeing a lot of demand from other countries who say, we would really like to use drones because we cannot access many parts of the countries, and in particular when we have disasters and need to quickly answer and have targeted answers. So it's, but it's really the, the government needs to work with the public and uh, the private sector is needed very much as well. Perfect. Not, you're not finished yet. Um, you know, you mentioned the elephant in the room before. 
the elephant in the room when it comes to you is the dual use of drone technology and the training, because obviously governments can use it to deliver food, but they can also use it to kill rebels, freedom fighters. Um, you have that problem, I think the dual use thematic, but how difficult is that for you? Is that a thing? Yeah, it hasn't been in the first um, instance, you know, when we were very much, you know, uh, now rolling out to Rwanda and Niger, but there, of course there are countries who are asking this at the moment where we think that could be a case for dual use. And at the moment we are quite hesitant and discussing with the leadership and of course within the UN, how should we come about it? Of course there's a lot about contracts you can do, but in the end if people are trained and are training the others, then it's of course without your scope. So it is, a, it is an issue. Perfect, thank, thank you so you. much. And again, sorry for putting you on the spot. We've got two minutes left. Is there a, another elephant in the room? Uh, well, we already talked about defense and government usage, and I think drones are an important part of the freedom and defense, not just of Europe, but also of Ukraine. Um, and that's something we will always support. And I think the other important thing, maybe what, what, what should you take away from the session? I think what you should take away from the session is Drones historically were these remotely piloted toys. We're entering a new era where they're actually flying computers and where, where they have completely new usage at completely new scale, where it's really exciting and where we will see them a lot more ubiquitous than the past 10 years, which is like, was more the tinkering experimentation phase. Perfect. With that, we end. Many thanks. That was just a brief glimpse. If you want to hear more about armed drones and the problems of standards and the, the lack of speed when it comes to NATO's implementation of drone standards, then um, look at the social media channels of the other Munich conference and you'll see a lot. Many thanks for your attention. Enjoy the rest of DLD.